Well, I've been talking about the subject of pacifism. And last week, I covered some of the texts that are used to support absolute pacifism. And for those who don't know, there's different types of pacifism. I guess you could say there's different degrees of pacifism. And the absolute view is that war is never justified under any circumstances whatsoever. That's the absolute pacifist position. And I made the case that these verses do not support that view of pacifism because none of them are, are found within contexts that are dealing with war. For example, the verse that says, turn the other cheek, is not used within a military context. It's talking about dealings with your neighbor and it isn't talking about warfare. So I, I believe, my personal belief is that the Bible teaches that war is justified at times. And today I'm going to try and make a case for that from Scripture. And before I begin, I, want, I just want to explain why this is important. Because it is, it's a very important issue. Because uh, every nation has a military. And there are people in these nations who are Christians and they're wondering whether they should, they should serve in the military or not. They want to know what God thinks about them serving in the military and fighting in war. And a few years ago, I had a young, a young man who came to me uh, from the church. And he was wondering if, if it was acceptable for him to join the Marine Corps. And my answer uh, was going to affect the rest of his life. And I wanted to know what what does God think about this? What, what is God's view on this? Because ultimately, there's really one thing that matters, and that's God's opinion. God's opinion is, is, is what counts. Man's opinion, well, there's so many. Men have so many different opinions. But it's God's opinion that matters. And so he, he came up to me, and he asked me the best question that anyone could have ever asked. And that question is, what does God think about this? And today, I want to give you my answer to him. And uh, my answer does not come from my opinion, but my answer comes from Scripture. So, Scripture is the ultimate authority on, on everything. And so, I want to tell you what I believe Scripture teaches about pacifism. So, the first thing I'm going to point out is this. Uh, the Old Testament gives instructions concerning warfare. If you read Deuteronomy 20, we're not going to read the entire chapter, um, but in Deuteronomy 20, God gave Israel instructions about how to go to war. And reading that chapter is actually really helpful in order to understand uh, the way that Israel did this because Israel didn't do it in some kind of tyrannical way. Um, so read that chapter and That'll give you a lot more details. But my, my point is, if God condemns all war, then he wouldn't have given Israel these kinds of instructions. If God's against all war, he would have just told Israel, you don't need a military, uh, you don't need to worry about that, just don't even bother with war because war is not necessary and I'm against it. But that wasn't God's, that wasn't God's view. As Solomon said, there is a time for war. Sometimes war is necessary. Now, I will, of course, I'll say that there's many wars that are completely unjustified. There's some wars that should have never happened. There's some wars that didn't need to happen. Uh, but some wars are necessary. And God knew that. And that's why he gave Israel laws regarding their conduct in war. Now, this is a good time to explore one of the biggest objections raised against God. And if you remember, uh, this was maybe a few months ago, I said that the number one objection raised against God by atheists is, without a shadow of a doubt, the problem of evil and suffering. If you watch debates between Christians and atheists, if you talk to atheists, which I've done many, many times, by far the number one objection they always bring up against God is the problem of evil and suffering. Well, the one 
the issue that I'm about to bring up is a close second. And that is, why did God command Israel to annihilate the Canaanites? And this is brought up constantly. Uh, this, is, this is brought up online. There's been a lot of um, videos made of trying to make God look bad, trying to make God look like some genocidal maniac for um, commanding the Israelites to wipe out the Canaanites. So uh, I will be the first one to admit that God did, in fact, command this. As a matter of fact, he commanded it on multiple occasions. In Deuteronomy 7, verses 1 and 2, it says, When the Lord your God brings you into the land where you are entering to possess it and clears away many nations before you, the Hittites and the Girgashites and the Amorites and the Canaanites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, a lot of ites there, seven nations greater and stronger than you, and when the Lord your God delivers them before you and you defeat them, then you shall utterly destroy them. You shall make no covenant with them and show them no favor. And that was the command. Now, for those who don't know, and because this is it's going to be helpful when I bring up this point, the Amorites, that was one of the groups that was mentioned in this list. The Amorites lived in Jerusalem before Israel did. That's why they're on the list. These were all the nations that lived in Canaan, that, that entire area. All these, all these different um, nations lived within the land of Canaan. And God said they need to be annihilated. There's a long history about this. And um, I'm not going to go over all the history. If you have more questions, you can ask me after the service. But um, I'm just going to give you a few things to consider today. Because some people, they read this stuff in the Old Testament, and they do no study, they do no research, and they just kind of take a quick glance at the text. And they go, wow, God seems pretty mean for doing that. Well, that sounds reasonable if you don't know anything about it. But if you, if you do study this and you do, um, do some research, what you'll find is that the Canaanites were not a peaceful, fun-loving group. Far from it. As a matter of fact, the Canaanites were some of the most vile people in history, at least uh, they were vile enough to want, uh, for God to want to annihilate them. And some people, uh, they don't realize that. But So the, the question then is, well, if God is love, and the Bible says that he is, if God is love, 1 John 4, 8, how do we reconcile God's love with his command to annihilate these groups of people? I want to give you five things to consider today. The first thing is this. God waited 400 years before destroying the Canaanites. Notice in Genesis 15, 16, God is speaking to Abraham. And God said, then in the fourth generation, they will return here, that is to the land of Canaan, for the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete. Now, I realize that verse is not crystal clear. Let me explain what's going on here. So God's talking to Abraham. And God is talking about Abraham's descendants years from, from then going back in, into the land and inheriting the land that God promised Abraham and his descendants. He said, your, your descendants are not going to inherit the land right away. They're going to remain in Egypt for 400 years. And after those 400 years are up, by that time, the sin of the Amorite will have reached its full measure. It'll be as bad as it can be. And once their sin has become as bad as it can be, then I'm going to send your descendants into the land to eradicate them. So it wasn't as if God just made this decision after a day. He didn't just wait a day and then decide, you know what, it's time to annihilate the Canaanites. He waited 400 years to do this. And we have reason to believe that God would have shown mercy to the Canaanites had they repented of their wickedness. I want to I want to um, point this out because you know, whenever God says He's going to annihilate a nation, that nation always has the ability to repent. 
that nation does not have to be destroyed. There's no reason it has to be. Notice what Jeremiah said. This is Jeremiah 18, 7 and 8. This is God speaking through Jeremiah. At one moment, I might speak concerning a nation or concerning a kingdom to uproot, to pull down, or to destroy it. If that nation against which I have spoken turns from its evil, I will relent concerning the calamity I planned to bring on it. God made it very clear. And notice he says, if I might say to any nation, I'm going to destroy you, I'm going to remove you from the land. God says, if that nation decides to repent, to turn from its wickedness, God says he will change his mind and not carry out his plan to destroy them. Now, I'll give you an example of this. Remember when God sent Jonah to Nineveh. And Nineveh was the capital of Assyria. And if you know anything about Assyria, Assyria was probably the most barbaric, savage nation in, in the Mediterranean world. These people, they would, when they captured cities, they would skin people alive and drape their skins over the city walls. They would chop the heads off of their captors and pile the heads up in a pyramid in front of the city. You wonder why Joe Note wasn't so anxious to go over there. <laughs> These people were savages, and the Jews hated them with a passion. And actually, probably a lot of people did because they were so barbaric and cruel. But what happened? God humbled Jonah greatly. Jonah ended up going to Nineveh, and he preached against the city. He said, Nineveh's going to be destroyed. Nineveh's going to be destroyed. Repent. And against all odds, they did repent. And remember what happened? It, God did not judge them. Actually, he did judge them. I'll explain that in a second. But God did not judge them at that time because they repented. And Jonah was very disappointed about this because he wanted to see the city annihilated. But God had mercy on these people because they repented. Their judgment was not inevitable. No judgment of a nation is inevitable. The, the nation can repent and they can find God's mercy just like any individual can. But we read history, we find out that actually Nineveh, uh, they turned back to their wicked ways after Jonah, repent, after Jonah preached to them and they repented. And God eventually destroyed them using Babylon. But that was after they turned back to their evil. So nations don't have to be judged. It's not, it's not inevitable. They can just repent. You know, people talk about how mean God was and, well, God punished this nation and that nation. Well, then don't do that stuff. Don't butcher people. Don't, well, I'll get into some of the sins in a minute because some of these sins were despicable. So after the Canaanites refused to repent for 400 years, their sin eventually reached its full measure and they became ripe for judgment. And again, God brought the Israelites out of Egypt through Moses. They came into the wilderness and after being in the wilderness for some time, Joshua led them into the promised land and they, they slaughtered the Canaanites. So no nation need, needs to fall under judgment, and the Canaanites didn't have to, but they refused to repent. The second thing I want to point out is this. The annihilation of the Canaanites was not an example of ethnic cleansing. There are some people who seem to believe that, that God is racist and that God punished the Canaanites because he's a big racist and he didn't like them because of their race. And I just got to ask these people, have you read anything in the Bible? The Canaanites were not punished because of their ethnicity. They were destroyed because of their behavior. It had nothing to do with ethnicity and had everything to do with behavior. God is no respecter of persons. As a matter of fact, God told Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, he said, I'm going to bless you and your descendants, and through you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. 
God's intention from the very beginning was to bless all people, not just Israel. Israel was a tool that God was going to use to bless all the rest of the nations. If you read Revelation chapter 7, and it talks about all the saints that came out of the Great Tribulation, it says that there were Christians from every tribe, people, tongue, nation. There were, every single nation is represented in heaven. Every single one of them. All nations are represented in heaven. God's not a racist. God doesn't want to keep certain people out. He wants to bring everybody in. And through repentance and faith, the person can, can be in from any nation. It doesn't matter what nation they're from. Any nation. All nations are welcome. The Canaanites could have been welcomed too, but they just wouldn't repent. So actually, you know, it's interesting. God is not a respecter of persons because God even punished his own people on multiple occasions. God sent the Assyrians to punish the northern kingdom of Israel. He sent Babylon to punish the southern kingdom of Judah. So God punished his own people very severely. God's no respecter of persons. God uh, even punishes his own people when he needs to. Number three, the Canaanites were guilty of terrible abominations. And what kind of abominations are we talking about? Things like child sacrifice. What, what, what the Canaanites would do is they had a, a statue and the statue had these hands that, were, that would come out like this and the hands were metal. It was a, basically the whole thing was made of metal and in the belly of the statue there was an oven and they would put wood in the oven, they would get this raging fire going and it would heat up the metal in the statue and they would take their children and place their children on this metal surface that was scalding hot and they would play music to mask the screams of the child as the child was sizzling to death on the surface. One of the things they did. But God's mean, guys, remember? Remember? Another thing they were guilty of is bestiality. These are the kinds of things they were involved with. Bestiality was something that they regularly partook of. Drinking people's blood. These kinds of foul, abominable things. And, and many other things. Their sins were extremely vile and worthy of death. And I would actually argue that it would have been wrong for God to allow the Canaanites to continue in their wicked ways. These sins were so vile and despicable that it would have been wrong for God not to, not to deal with these people. And you know, someone pointed this out. I, it's, there's, there's just such great irony here because atheists will often, they'll criticize God for allowing evil and suffering in the world. And then they get mad at God when he deals with evil and suffering. God can't win, can he? He allows evil and suffering, yes, and then when he tries to deal with it by sending the Israelites to, to stop this evil, then atheists are up in arms about it. No matter what God does, people will always find fault, no matter what. No matter what. Four. God ordered the annihilation of the Canaanites so they would not lead Israel astray. One of the things that God was very concerned with was uh, having the Israelites go into the land and then having the Canaanites corrupt the Israelites and the situation becoming even worse than it was before. The whole point of sending Israel uh, into the land was really not so much to get Israel into the land, but to get the Canaanites out. Because God wanted the land to be pure. He wanted the land to be holy. He wanted the land to be free from this, these vile abominations. And so he used Israel to get all these Canaanites out and Israel in so that the land could be a place of righteousness, so that God could be represented in the land through, through Israel. That was, that was God's goal. Verse 
and God didn't want to leave the Canaanites in there and them corrupt the Israelites. As, as a matter of fact, in Deuteronomy 7, 4, God said, For they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods. Then the anger of the Lord will be kindled against you, and he will quickly destroy you. And if you read Scripture, if you read the rest of Israel's history, you'll find that what God was worried about is exactly what ended up happening. After Israel refused to destroy all the Canaanites, the Canaanites did influence them. They did turn to other gods. And Israel even started sacrificing their children to false gods, just like the Canaanites were doing. You know, God doesn't tell people things for no reason. God doesn't tell people things just to, just to tell them what to do. Whenever God says to do something, there's always a reason for it. And it's always good. Everything that God says to do is good. Everything. Even this. And I think part of the Christian life is just learning to accept the fact that whatever God says is good, it might not initially make sense to me. It might, it, uh, it might seem painful at times. It, it, it go, it'll, it's going to go against what the world says. I promise you that. If you follow God, you can't follow the world because they're going in two different directions. What God says is always good. Always. Always. Even if we don't understand it all. So while God's commands to annihilate the Canaanites seems harsh, it was actually beneficial for other nations and it actually prevented further evil and suffering. And number five, just a logical point. If atheism is true and there's no absolute moral standard, then what standard are atheists using to condemn God's command to destroy the Canaanites? If there, if there is an absolute moral standard, then God is that standard. And if God is that standard, then his command to annihilate the Canaanites must have been right. Some people think, well, there's no standard of right and wrong. You guys have, have heard this. Postmodernism. There's no absolute moral standard. What's right for you, that's, that's what's right for you. What's right for me is right for me. And morality is something that is determined by the individual. And if that's true, if, if, if what you think is right is right, and what I think is right is right, and we don't agree, then who's ultimately right here? And if there's no moral standard, how can anyone say God's wrong to do this or that? Because isn't it just one person's opinion against another? If there's no moral standard, you can't say this is wrong or this is right because it's just a subjective opinion. And what's interesting is a lot of people that claim this is the way it is don't even live that way. They claim morality is subjective, but yet they live every day of their lives as if there really is an absolute right and wrong. But if there is no absolute right and wrong, no one can say God was doing wrong by annihilating the Canaanites. There's another reason why I believe war is sometimes justified. And that is because not only did God give Israel instructions concerning warfare, but he even trained them for war himself. Notice in Judges chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, it says, Now these are the nations which the Lord left to test Israel by them. That is, all who had not experienced any of the wars of Canaan, only in order that the generations of the sons of Israel might be taught war, those who had not experienced it formerly. So there were certain Canaanite nations left. And these Canaanite nations were left over so that the new generations could learn war by fighting against them. God wanted to train his people for war. Because God's smart. God knows. You know, you, you might have a nation that's very peaceful. Don't count on other nations being peaceful. And if they come against you, you're going to need to defend yourself. 
And if someone is in need of help, if one nation, if a tyrannical nation is coming against a peaceful nation, that peaceful nation is going to need your help. If a nation is committing terrible abominations, they need to be stopped. So God knew that war was sometimes necessary. In Psalm 144, verse 1, David wrote, Blessed blessed be the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for war and my fingers for battle. God trained his people for war because he knew that war is sometimes necessary. I said this last week, and I want to repeat it. God understands that war, although horrible by nature, is sometimes necessary in order to prevent further evil and suffering in the world. Even if a war is being carried out for for just reasons, it's still terrible. Even righteous wars, or wars fought for justified reasons, even those wars are terrible. Absolutely terrible. All war is terrible by its very nature. But sometimes war is just the lesser of two evils. And unfortunately, war is going to continue to be necessary as long as there's sin in the world. We live in a world filled with sin, filled with hate, filled with evil. And the world is not going to change in any big way, I don't think, until Christ comes back. So unfortunately, war is just going to be a reality um, until the second coming where Christ brings an end to war. And it's, it's going to be peace and safety and security uh, during that time. But we're not there yet. And finally, uh, this, the, the last reason why I believe that war and serving in the military is acceptable to God is because the New Testament does not require soldiers to repent of their military service in order to become Christians. If you notice, if you read the the New Testament, what you'll find is there are all these examples of Jesus or the apostles or John the Baptist or somebody talking with soldiers and explaining to them how to become saved. In Matthew Matthew chapter 8, verses 5 through 13, a Roman centurion asked Jesus to heal his paralyzed servant. And rather than rejecting the man's request because he was in the military, Jesus agreed to heal his servant and he praised the man's faith, saying, Truly I say to you, I have not found such great faith with anyone in Israel. Here's a man, here's a soldier and active military guy and he he asked Jesus to heal his servant and Jesus if Jesus was against war he says you know what I can't heal your servant because you're in the military and I don't approve of that that's a sin Jesus never said that Jesus healed his servant and he he praised the man's faith he said I I can't even find faith like this among my own people And here's this Gentile who has tremendous faith in me. In Luke 3, verse 14, some soldiers asked John the Baptist what they should do to escape God's wrath. And John said, Do not take money from anyone by force or accuse anyone falsely and be content with your wages. Now, notice what John didn't say. He didn't say that they needed to repent of their military service in order to be pleasing to God. He never told them that. He actually said, be content with your wages that you're being paid for being in the military. Be content with your situation. But he never told them they had to leave the military and and become uh, absolute pacifists. That was not a requirement. He accepted the fact that they were in the military and he never condemned them for that specific thing. It was possible to serve as a soldier and live a righteous life at the same time. The Bible gives no, uh, presents no conflict between those two things. Scripture speaks of a man named Cornelius 
who was a centurion of what was called the Italian cohort. That's in Acts chapter 10. And the Bible says he was a devout man and one who feared God with all his household and gave many alms to the Jewish people and prayed to God continually. This is a, this is a, a man in the military, and he was a devout man of God. He, he served God. He was a very generous man. He gave many gifts to, uh, to people in need among the Jewish people. He was a righteous man, and yet he was a soldier in the military. And the Bible says that his prayers and his alms, which is like, you know, charitable, uh, charitable giving, it says that his, his prayers and his alms ascended as a memorial before God. So here's this man serving in the military, a devout man, and he is, he is so devout and so generous that God was actually impressed with the way he was living his life. And God was so impressed that he sent Peter to Cornelius. And Peter preached the gospel to Cornelius. And him and, him and his entire household got saved. They were, they were God-fearing people before this. Now remember, this was during the early church. And the gospel was just starting to, to spread. It really hadn't spread that far. And so people were not, a lot of people, there was people who were few, feared God, but they just simply didn't know the gospel and they hadn't been regenerated yet. Cornelius is an example of one of those people. So this man was a soldier, but he was pleasing to God and, and he was a devoted man. His, his military service did not hinder his spiritual life. So my belief is that the Bible does not forbid Christians from serving in the military and participating in war. Uh, the verses that are used to support absolute passivism are not found within contexts that are dealing with military service or warfare. Furthermore, God commanded Israel to make war against the Canaanites in order to punish them for their sins and put an end to their abominable practices. And not only did God command the Israelites to go to war, but he even trained them for war. And as I just pointed out, the New Testament does not require soldiers to repent of their military service in order to become Christians. Instead, a person can be a soldier and a follower of Jesus Christ at the same time. So there's no conflict between any of these things. Now, having said that, I also want to, I'm going to go back to something I said last week because this is really important. The Bible says repeatedly that if you do anything that violates your conscience, then you're in sin. If you do anything that violates your conscience, then, then you're, you're disobeying God. And it was, there was a very unique situation in the Roman church when Paul wrote to the Romans, he wrote to them and he, apparently there was, there was some Jewish Christians, and there were some Gentile Christians. And the, the, even though the Jewish Christians were not required to follow the ceremonial aspects of the law, like, you know, eating only certain kinds of food and whatnot, because these Jews were so sensitive to these kosher laws, they still felt the need to obey those kosher laws. Now, Paul said, if you read later in the chapter, Paul said, all food is clean. No, no, no food is unclean. Jesus said the same thing in Mark 7, 19. The Bible's clear. All food is clean. All food is, is permissible to eat. Here's the problem. Because these Jews had a sensitive conscience, God, uh, Paul said this, um, but God was, of course, speaking through him. Uh, Paul said to the Christians, he said, listen, Jews, if your conscience is sensitive to this, to these kosher laws, you, you can let your conscience lead, okay? Don't, don't violate your conscience. And he says, Gentiles, your conscience allows you to do anything you want. Go for it. Who's right? Well, in a sense, both of them are right because they're both going by their conscience. So if a person's conscience forbids them from fighting in war, then they can't fight in war. Then they can't do it. Um, so that's, that's something they need to take, 
very seriously. So how do we know something's wrong? By Scripture. And Scripture tells us what God thinks about it. But also we follow our conscience and we recognize that if our conscience is violated by something, then for us, that's a sin. So we keep our conscience clear. If, if our conscience is sensitive about something, we don't do that. We keep it clear. And we follow God's word. And also, you know, sometimes, sometimes a person's conscience can change. You know, there are things that, that I used to think were wrong that I realize are not now. And there are things I used to think were okay and I realize they're not now. So the conscience sometimes needs to be trained. The conscience is not necessarily perfect. It's something that, that is enlightened by the word of God. And, um, and ultimately, guys, this. This is what you need to know. This, the word of God, is... I'll, I'll, I'll say this. I said this so many times. I'll just say, I just want to keep repeating this. If you don't know the Bible, it's not that you will be deceived. It's that you already are. You, you start off deceived. And you go to the Bible to become less deceived. And you spend the rest of your life reading and studying and seeking to become as little deceived as possible. So it's... if. It's not, if you don't read the Bible, it's not that you, you know, it's, it's not that you're going to be deceived eventually, it's that you already are. So we, we have to read the word, especially in this day and age with all these bizarre ideas, these bizarre teachings, people have abandoned the churches, some, not all, of course. Some churches, the Bible is long gone and they're led by personal feelings, um, cultural fads. And um, ultimately, it's the way of death. So study the word. And this is my conviction. I believe the Bible teaches this about, uh, about pacifism. And if you, if, you, uh, if you disagree, we can talk about it. And, um, but either way, you, you have my blessing still. So how about that? <laughs> All right. Let's go to the Lord in prayer today. Father, I realize that this is, a, this is one of those subjects where there's just probably always going to be some disagreement in the church. And I, I'm okay with that because I know there's some people, their conscience just won't let them fight in war. And really, I can understand that. I mean, think about it. If you kill somebody, you, you have just determined their eternal destiny. And um, so I, I, I think there's, there's some serious things to consider there. But at the same time, Lord, as I read your word, I, I'm convinced that nowhere in, in, the, in the word is, is war completely forbidden. War is sometimes necessary. And I, I think that uh, it, was, it was necessary for America to get involved in World War II to prevent the Nazis from continuing to commit all these horrible atrocities, these terrible, terrible things they were doing, killing millions of people, men, women, and children who had done you know, really nothing wrong and just awful, awful atrocities. Father, I, I can't imagine what this world would be like today if America had not gotten involved in that conflict. And thank, uh, thank you, Lord, that, that they did. Because that was, that I believe that was totally necessary. Sometimes evil needs to be crushed. Sometimes evil needs to be eradicated. And not always. There's other ways of handling things. But there are times when it just needs to be done away with. So, I, Lord, I thank you for enlightening us through your word. I thank you for teaching us. I thank you, Lord, for always leading us into the truth. And if we have a, a heart that's open, a heart that desires truth, I know that we'll always find it. Lord, we thank you for, uh, for teaching us. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for always being with us. And we pray these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen.